Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 29. Throughout church history, we hear a word, and that word is revival. And if you polled or asked different people what revival is and what revival means, you would probably get as many answers as people you ask. But most believers that are sincere in their faith and their walk with the Lord would agree if you ask, do we need revival? They would say, yes, we do. And different people have different ideas of how to have revival. Some put a committee together and pick a date on the calendar and put it on the marquee and say, y'all come for these weeks, we're going to have revival. It's just going to happen. Now, I do believe that we can have revival if we want to have revival. But I also believe there are certain things that we must do in order for that to happen. And the good news, over the next four chapters, we're going to be looking at one of Judah's kings, I believe the second greatest of all of Israel's kings, second to David, and that would be Hezekiah. And in each one of these chapters, beginning with this chapter, we're going to see a revival take place in Judah. And I want us to look at what they did. Because I believe if you and I are going to experience revival in our church, if we're going to experience revival in our own personal lives, these things must be present. This is going to be an interesting study tonight because there are 13 things that we see happening here and so it's going to be quick it's going to be fast you're going to just have to take notes or get a cd afterwards in order to cover it all i would love to spend a good 10 20 30 minutes for each one but i'm sure i'd be here by myself if i did that but the first thing we see hezekiah do as a king is repairing the temple repairing the temple so let's jump in. Verse 1, it says, Hezekiah began to reign when he was 5 and 20 years old. He was 25, and he reigned 9 and 20 years. 29 years, a fairly long reign, considering some of the other kings. And because of his faith and love for the Lord, I'm sure that was part of it. It says he reigned in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Abijah the daughter of Zechariah. This is interesting. I got to hit it real fast as I move through. We live in a fatherless society. More and more so, we see that being an epidemic, especially in America. Another epidemic is the result of people who make excuses for themselves because they had an absentee father. And I find no biblical basis for it. Or some have a father that's present, but for whatever their own reasoning, they don't think he did the job that he should do. And as a result, they make excuses for their own decisions, for their own shortcomings, for their own lives. Now, it's interesting. Hezekiah means Jehovah shall strengthen. But his mother's name, and notice, his father is not mentioned. Ahaz was his father, one of the most wicked of all of Judah's kings. If any man had an excuse, I had a bad dad, Hezekiah could say that. But his mother's mention, and her name means, take note, Jehovah is my father. Her name means Jehovah is my father. 
The psalmist says, when my father and mother forsake me, the Lord shall take me up. So, for those who know or experience being a single mom, be encouraged. God can use that influence, that mother, to impact the life of her children. That's not the title of our message, but hey, there it is. Verse 2, it says, And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. Hezekiah looks back and says, I'm not going to be like dad. He could have went back and says, well, my grandfather Jotham, he was an okay guy, but he had issues. I'm not going to be like Jotham. He could have said, well, I'm going to go back to my great-grandfather Uzziah. He started out good, but he didn't end up very well, so I don't want to model my life after his. So he goes all the way back to the model, the pattern that God set for every one of these kings. So I don't know what dad's like, grandpa's like, great-grandpa's like, but you can go all the way back to the model, the king, Jesus Christ. That's who I need to be modeling in the first place. Not mom, dad, Aunt Susie, or uncle whoever. I need to be modeling the Lord, and that's what he does. In 2 Kings 18, you can write that down and look later, but it gives a complete description of all that Hezekiah did. One of the things that he did that's interesting before we move forward, all these other good kings that we've read about, we read about all that they did, but they didn't remove the high places. They left these high places. They did all these other things right, but they left the high places. They were very popular among the people. Hezekiah had the courage to remove them. Not only did he do that, we're told in 2 Kings 18, do you remember the brazen serpent that God told Moses to make when they were murmuring and complaining and fiery serpents came out into the camp and he said, put this brazen serpent on the pole and whoever would look to that in faith, if they were bitten by the serpent, they would be made whole. That had become an idol in Israel and he destroyed that serpent. And then we're told in verse 3, he in the first year of his reign in the first month. Now, a lot of presidents and politicians, and even the one we have, they love to say, look what I accomplished in the first 90 days, or the first 60 days, or the first year, or the, my first term. Well, Hezekiah, this king, in the first year, and not just in the first year, but the first month, his number one priority, the thing that he did first. And interestingly, quick side note, if you remember our study, Three Steps from the Sanctuary, Hezekiah, Jotham, Ahaz, we see Hezekiah reversing each one of those steps in this chapter, beginning with this first Step, which was the last step in our study. The first thing he did was opened the doors of the house of the Lord. If you remember in chapter 28, verse 24, his dad, Ahaz, locked the doors to God's house. He shut the doors. And the first thing Hezekiah does in the first month is we open the doors. If you want revival, if you seek revival in your life, you need to open the doors to God's house. Every revival that has ever taken place in history happened not at the movie theater, 
Not at the mall, not at the rodeo, not in a fishing tournament, not at a ball game, not in any of those places. And I'm not saying you can't do those things and go to those places, but they happen when God's people earnestly gather together in his name to seek him. Amen. So the first thing we see is to open the doors. Now, while we're talking about open doors, I want to remind you of Revelation chapter 3. Jesus says this, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man will hear my voice and open that door, I'll come into him and sup with him and he with me. The first thing we see he does is he opens the doors of the house of the Lord. He reverses what his father Ahaz had done. Now we come to our first point in verse four. We see the overseers in this rebuilding or repairing of the temple. It says, And he brought the priests and the Levites and gathered them together into the east street. He gathers them together. And now the second point, verse 5, that was quick, wasn't it? The orders. He tells them what to do. And he said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, Sanctify now yourselves. Sanctify yourselves and sanctify the house of the Lord of your fathers and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. The second thing that you and I must do if we want revival in our life, we're to open up the doors of the house of the Lord. The next thing we must do is get rid of the filth. We can't have revival in our lives with filthiness in our lives. James talks about that. He says, lay aside all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. You got to get rid of that stuff. If you've got filth in your life, you got to get rid of it if you want revival. One of the problems with revival today is we live in this idea where grace gives me a license to do whatever I want to do. We've got Christians who show up on Sunday and what they've been doing Friday and Saturday is a far cry from what's taking place on Sunday. And we think that somehow by grace we can flip a switch. Well, God's not into switch flipping. God's into us removing the filth from our lives. So he tells them to do that. And he says in verse 6, For our fathers have trespassed and done that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord our God, and hath forsaken him, and have turned away their faces. Hebrews 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. They turned away their faces. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all with open face, beholding as in a, a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into that same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. We need to be beholding Him, looking to Him. They turned away their faces, but not only that. It says they, they turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord and turned their backs we won't turn there, but in 2 Kings 16, Ahaz goes and visits some of the pagan people. And while he's there, he sees one of their altars. He's intrigued by it. He likes it. So he, he comes back and he fashions one like the pagan altar. And he literally moves God's altar out of its place and establishes a pagan altar in its place where they literally had to turn their back from the Lord to offer their sacrifices. He said they've turned their faces and they've turned their backs. Hebrews 10.39 says, we are not of those that draw back. In Luke 9, Jesus said the last verse in our study, what, a week ago or two weeks ago, whoever puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom. That's why Paul in Philippians 3.14 says, I press, I press, I'm moving forward, I'm not backing up. They turn their backs, verse 7, also they have shut up the doors of the porch, put out the lamps, 
and have not burned incense nor offered burnt offerings, their fire is out. Their fire went out in the holy place of the God of Israel. Wherefore, here's the result, the wrath of the Lord was upon Judah and Jerusalem, and he hath delivered them to trouble, to astonishment, and to hissing, as ye see with your eyes. Hezekiah says, just look around. At this point, he could say, look at the northern kingdom. At this point, they're three years from being carried away into captivity. At the height of their sin, he said, just look at what's happening. He says, for lo, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. Now, it is in mine heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. Here's another thing we must do if we want revival. We must purpose in our heart to make a covenant, to be committed to the Lord, to be committed to him. Then he says in verse 11, my sons, be not negligent. Be not negligent. For the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him, to serve him, and that ye should minister unto him and burn incense. He speaks of their position. He speaks of their practice. He speaks of their priority. And I believe ultimately he speaks of prayer because Psalm 142, 2, the psalmist says, let my prayer come before you like the evening sacrifice or burning of incense. If we want revival, we've got to begin serving the Lord again. And ministry is ministering unto Him. Far too many people are in ministry. They're serving the Lord. And yes, we do serve the Lord. But our top priority, our highest motivation should be ministering unto the Lord. When I come here and worship before the Lord, it should be ministry unto Him. I must confess quite often, it's focused on me. It's, Lord, bless me. Lord, move in my life. Lord, fill me with your Spirit. And it should be more ministering unto Him than seeking ministry from Him or doing even ministry for Him. He says, God chose you. Don't be negligent to minister unto the Lord. Verse 12. And the Levites arose, and then there's names in verses 12, 13, and 14, And now we're at 15. Boy, that was quick. Do you like how I did that? I'm fluent with those Hebrew names. (laughs) It says in verse 15, And they gathered their brethren and sanctified themselves and came according to the commandment of the king by the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. And notice verse, verse 16. It says, And the priest went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it, and brought out all the uncleanness. And they found in the temple of the Lord into the court of the house of the Lord, and the Levites took it to carry it abroad into the brook Kidron. Now I want to remind you of verse 5. In verse 5, Hezekiah said, Carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. We see in verse 16 that yes, the priests went in and they removed the uncleanness that was found in the temple. They brought it out of the temple and they put it into the court. There in the court, the Levites took what was in the court, they took it out of the temple completely, carried it out of the city completely, into the, the valley, the brook Kidron, and dumped it there. They removed it as far as they could. They removed it as far as they could. I want to read a passage of Scripture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 7. Paul says this, For God hath not called us 
unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. They went beyond what the king asked. Paul says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by any. Far too many Christian people are doing things, me included, that are lawful for me to do. I'm living under grace. I have liberty and freedom in Christ. But it's not beneficial. So the question shouldn't be, as a Christian, can I watch this show? As a Christian, can I listen to this music? As a Christian, can I go here? Can I do this? The question should be, is it beneficial? Is it going to produce those things in my life that God desires to be produced? Or are those things going to hinder? You see, the writer of Hebrews tells us to lay aside the sin. And most Christians are willing to do that. Yes, get rid of the sin. Get rid of all that nasty, bad stuff. But he doesn't stop there. He says, lay aside the sin and the weight that doth so easily beset you. See, I'm not a runner. If you're a runner, I, I admire you. I don't want to run unless something's after me, and if I've got a big enough stick or a long enough knife or a, enough bullets, I don't want to run. I just want to take care of what's threatening me. But some people love to run, and running is found in the Scripture as a picture of our relationship and our Christian journey with the Lord. Runners, some of them, I think go too far. But runners wear little of nothing in order to run. And they don't want to be cumbered by a lot of clothing. They don't want to be restricted. They want to be able to run. And the writer of Hebrews says, lay aside the, the sin. Lay aside the sin, yes, but the weight. There are things in our lives that aren't sin. The Holy Spirit's not convicting us of it. He's not saying, this is sin, get it out of your life. But it's weighing me down. It's slowing my progress. It's hindering me in my walk. God's not going to rain down judgment upon me because it's there. But I'm going to miss out. I'm going to miss out. These people wanted revival. And if we want revival, there's some things that we've got to get out and not just get out. We need to get it as far away as we possibly can. We're told even to shun the very appearance of evil. Verse 17. Now they begun on the first day of the first month to sanctify, and on the eighth day of the month came they to the porch of the Lord. So they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days, and in the sixteenth day of the first month they made an end. It took them eight days to get the filth out of the holy place in the temple. Another eight days to get what they moved from the temple out of the court. Can you imagine? Sixteen days of cleaning house. That's a lot of filth. That's a lot of rubbish. 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 Eat your rubbish. It's good for you. Rubbish. But don't my life, don't sometimes your life get cluttered. We become spiritual hoarders. We've got stuff in our life that is 15, 20 years old, some of us, and it's just been sitting there collecting dust, taking up space in the temple. And if we would remove that thing, that would be more space the Holy Spirit could claim. They removed all of this stuff from the temple. And verse 18 says, And they went into Hezekiah the king and said to the king, We have cleansed all the house of the Lord and the altar of the burnt offering and all the vessels thereof 
and the showbread table and all the vessels thereof. Moreover, all the vessels which King Ahaz in his reign did cast away in his transgression have we prepared and sanctified, and behold, they are before the altar of the Lord. They come back to the king and they say, King Hezekiah, we did it. We finished the job. We did what you told us to do. That's another thing we must do if we want revival. We must be doers of the word, not just hearers. Oh, I know God tells me to forgive my enemy, but <laughs> Sally done went too far. No, we need to be doers of the word. I know I'm supposed to pray and I'm supposed to have a quiet time and the preacher talks about it, especially that Gordon guy. He talks about it all the time. He, he's just hung up on that, but I'm busy, you see. Doers of the word. I know Victor and the praise team gets up there and they, they lead us in songs, but you know, sometimes I'm just tired. I, I, just, I just don't feel it. And you know, God understands. Yes, he understands what a sacrifice of praise is. Doers of the word. These people did what the king told them to do. You and I ought to be able to do that. When Jesus tells us to do something, Lord, king, I did it. I finished it. I completed the job. There's joy in that. You ever had a task and you finished it and you just felt good about it? God wants us to experience that spiritually. There's joy in doing what he tells us to do. Completing a task. Well, now that we've had our third point, I'll slow down a bit. We don't want to finish too soon, do we? We've looked at the overseers and the orders and now we're going to look at the offerings. That's what makes all the difference. It says, Then Hezekiah the king rose early. Anytime you find that in the scripture, it's an indication that the individual is serious about what they're doing for the Lord. They rose early. When God told Abraham to offer Isaac, the Bible tells us that he rose up early in the morning. He, he didn't hit the snooze and procrastinate and put it off. He got up early anticipating what God told him to do. He rose up early and he gathered all the rulers of the city and he went up into the house of the Lord. Now this was step two. This is what Jotham did wrong. In our study of three steps from the sanctuary, the third step, Ahaz shut up the doors of the house of the Lord and we've already seen Hezekiah retrace or reverse those steps. He's opened up the house of the Lord and now he's doing what Jotham, his grandfather, didn't do. He pleased the Lord, he served the Lord, but he never went into the house of the Lord. And now Hezekiah, verse 20, is going in to the house of the Lord. And they brought seven bullocks and seven rams and seven lambs and seven he goats. Seven, seven, seven. Seven is the number of completion in the scripture. And the first offering they make, sin offering. If you and I want revival in our life, we must deal with the sin in our life. Can't have revival, living in sin. They brought these things for a sin offering for the kingdom and for the sanctuary and for Judah. And he commanded the priests, the sons of Aaron, to offer them on the altar of the Lord. This is the first step in the three steps. If you remember, it all started when Uzziah the king said, I'm going into the house of the Lord and I'm going to burn incense like a priest. He overstepped in the house of the Lord and God kicked him out of the house and gave him leprosy. As a result, Jotham, his son, said, I'm not going in there. And as a result, his son Ahaz shut the door. So we've seen Hezekiah reverse those steps. We can always come back. There's always grace. There's always mercy. The Lord is always inviting us back. He opens the house of the Lord. He goes into the house of the Lord, but he's wise enough to say, you priests, you handle this. 
I'm in the house of the Lord, but I'm not a priest. I'm not the one to do this service. You do this service. They make this sin offering for an atonement for the people. Now in the Old Testament, atonement meant to cover the sin. In the New Testament, atonement takes on a cleansing, a complete cleansing of sin. In Hebrews chapter 10, we don't have time to go there, but the writer of Hebrews talks about the blood of bulls and goats and all of those things could never, ever remove the consciousness of sin. But the blood of Christ offered once is sufficient. 1 John 1, 9 says, if you send a whole bunch, God's done with you. No, no, that's not what it says. 1 John 1, 9 says, confess your sin. He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Well, what does that feel like? Don't know. Don't care. Don't matter. Confess. It's done. God said it. That settles it. They give the sin offering. And it says in verse 22, they killed the bullocks and the priests received the blood and sprinkled it on the altar. Likewise, when they had killed the rams, they sprinkled the blood upon the altar. They killed also the lambs, and they sprinkled the blood upon the altar. In some of these new gatherings, churches of people, they don't talk a lot about the blood because, you know, that's kind of icky and, and, and that's not seeker-friendly. But without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. There's no remission of sin. The temple was a bloody mess. I mean, think about it. Now, some people don't like to see blood. I don't mind seeing your blood. I don't like seeing my blood. If I see my blood, I kind of get a little, whew. There's been a few times that I thought, I thought, lights out, but it hasn't happened yet. I hope it doesn't happen. But blood was everywhere. Blood was everywhere. And this is why Jesus shed his blood. He gave his life. The life is in the blood. And it's that life. It's that substitute. Speaking of substitute, look what happens, verse 23. And they brought forth the he goat for the sin offering before the king and the congregation, and they laid their hands upon them. This wasn't a distant thing. When you brought your sacrifice for a sin offering, you placed your hand on that animal. It wasn't a matter of, okay, well, I'm going to just let the priest take care of that. You know, you don't just go behind closed doors and let the priest handle it. I'm going to move on. Some of you got it. Some of you will think about it. It'll get you on the way. Oh, okay, I know what he's saying. You put your hand there while that priest took that knife and slit that animal's throat, blood spattering everywhere. It was a symbol of transferring your guilt. You were acknowledging an innocent life taking yours. This animal bearing your sin. And that's why Paul writes to Timothy and he says, lay hold on eternal life. We need to understand what Christ did for us. We need to get our hands dirty, if you will. There needs to be a personal application in this process, not some distance. Oh, yeah, I know somewhere back there Jesus died and I know that's what they preach and I'll be back at church at Easter. No. This was a very personal thing. It said, and the priest killed them and they made reconciliation with the blood upon the altar to make an atonement for all Israel. And the king commanded the burnt offering. So first was the sin offering. That was for cleansing. The burnt offering is for consecration. To be set aside, it was to be wholly burnt. Completely consumed. So not only am I to confess my sin and be forgiven, be cleansed. I am to do what Paul says in Romans 12, to offer my life a living sacrifice. I am to surrender my life completely to him, which is another thing we must do if we want revival in our lives. Once again, it's not a sweet. I live my life however I want to live and I show up on Sunday and whoo, shazam. No, that's not how it happens. If you see people living in revival, you see people doing these things. So there's the burnt offering that was commanded. Verse 25, And he set the Levites in the house of the Lord 
with cymbals and psalteries and harps according to the commandment of David and Gad, the king's seer, and Nathan the prophet. For so was the commandment of the Lord by the prophets. Interesting, interesting. David made the commandment, but the writer here tells us who the commandment came from. It was God that said, bring out the instruments. And there are those who claim they shouldn't be used. Hmm. The Levites stood with their instruments of David. The instruments of David. Not only was David a worshiper, he invented instruments. Isn't that something? I love this guy. He was a man after God's own heart. He would sit around and think up instruments to make in order to bring praise to God. Think up new ways to praise the Lord. The priests and the trumpets and Hezekiah commanded to offer the burnt offering upon the altar. And when the burnt offering began, notice this, when the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord began. Why does Victor pick that song? Why don't we sing that song? Why don't we sing this song? Because we're singing the song of the Lord. The truth is, if it's biblical, does it matter? Does it matter? You know, I, I grew up in a church. It was different than our church. And, and, and they had special songs that when you played those special songs, you played them about 15, 20, 30, 40 times. And you kept playing them until you got some kind of response from the people. It's the song of the Lord. And whether it's amazing grace or whatever it may be, it's the song of the Lord. And I'm singing because of the offering. I'm singing because of what he did. Verse 28 says, And all the congregation worshipped. We need revival. Because I'm not sure we can say that at the porch. Because some folks, well, they don't like worship. The question is, do they like revival? And the singers sang and the trumpeters sounded and they continued until the burnt offering was finished. And when they had made an end of offering the king and all that were present with him bowed themselves and worshipped. Moreover, Hezekiah the king and the princes commanded the Levites to sing praise unto the Lord with the words of David and of Asaph the seer. And they sang praises with gladness, and they bowed their heads and worshipped. Then Hezekiah answered and said, Now ye have consecrated yourselves. Notice two things here if we want revival. We see in verse 28, 29, and 30, Sing. But what about those saints that don't like singing? Now's your time to prepare because guess what you're going to do in heaven? For a long, long, long time. Eternity is a long time. And they notice, verse 30, they were commanded to sing praises with gladness. I don't like singing. Do it anyway. And do it with joy. Well, I can't sing. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Or it don't sound good. Don't matter. The Lord says, make a joyful noise. Notice, He doesn't say make a noise. He says make a joyful noise. They were commanded to sing with gladness. Not only did they sing three verses here, in verse 27, 28, and 30, we're told that they worshipped the Lord. They worshipped the Lord. Worship is something that takes place in the spirit, in the heart. It actually involves the whole being of the individual. But this lets us know that we can stand in the congregation, the sanctuary, and we can sing and not worship. We can sing and not worship. 
they bowed their heads. They humbled themselves before the Lord and they worshipped Him. Why? Did God deliver them from an enemy? Nope. Did God give them a whole bunch of money? Nope. Did God heal them of all of their sickness? Nope. They worshipped because of the offering. They worship because of the offering. Worship is not about what God's gonna do. Amen. Worship is about who God is and what God has already done. If God never does another thing for me until He calls me home, think about that. Never answers another prayer. Never, never smiles on me another day. I never feel anything. He's worthy of my worship because of who He is and because of what He's done. Now notice, verse 31, Hezekiah answered and said, now that you've consecrated yourselves, so there was the cleansing, the sin offering, there was the consecration, the burnt offering. Here's the third step in the offerings. He says, come near. Come near. Far too many Christians tonight have confessed their sin. They said, Lord, I blew it, I blundered, I messed up, I failed, I faltered, I fumbled, please forgive me. And that's good, and they should. And God forgives when we ask. But they need to hear what Hezekiah is saying. After you confess, you need to repent. It's consecration. You confess your sin, you repent. Repent doesn't mean go get your life all straightened out and come back and tell God so He can be happy. No, repentance means to turn, to change your mind. Lord, I'm sorry that I did this. Forgive me. Now I'm turning to You, Lord, once again. I'm returning. I'm surrendering. I'm giving myself to You. And now that I've done that, notice, come near. Come near. Far too many Christians are living distant from the Lord unnecessarily. Once you've confessed, He's forgiven. Once you surrender, He takes over. And now, He wants you to come near. James 4, I believe it's verse 7, says, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Remember the prodigal son? They're in the pig pen. Wow. I don't think we appreciate the pig pen I mean, this Jewish guy feeding pigs, an unkosher animal. Everyone's left him. He has nothing left. He's covered in slop, stinking like a pig. He comes to himself and he says, I will arise and go back to my father. As soon as the father saw him, the father ran away. No, no, that's not what he did. The only record we have in all of Scripture Describing God the Father, the omnipotent, almighty creator of the universe, running. Running to his son that was lost, but now is found, who was dead and now alive again. The father ran to him. Not the prodigal running to the father. As soon as he saw him, he's running to him. He falls on his neck. The son had this speech all planned out. He says, when I get back to my father, I'm going to say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called a son. Make me a hired servant. If you go back and read the account, he doesn't get to finish because the father interrupts him. I don't need to hear all of that. Go get a robe. Go get a ring. Go get some shoes. Kill the fatted calf. My son's home. Hezekiah says, now that you've consecrated yourself, come near, come near. You've been separated. Your sin has, sin has pushed you away, but now God's saying, pull in close, draw near. God's inviting, come near. Can I remind you tonight, or if you don't know, encourage you, you can be as close to God as you want to be. And if you're not as close to God tonight as you want to be, it's your fault. It's not the preacher's fault. It's not the devil's fault. It's not anybody's, not mama's fault, daddy's fault. It's, it's your fault. Because God has said, 
He's no respecter of person. Draw near. You give me one indication that you're wanting to get close to me and I'll be right there. I'll be right there. Wow. He says, now that you've consecrated yourself, come near. And he says, bring sacrifices of thank offerings into the house of the Lord. And the congregation brought in sacrifices and thank offerings. And as many as were of a free heart brought offerings. If you don't want to give to God, don't. Can a preacher say that? If you don't want to give, don't. But I'll tell you this. God won't bless stingy folks. He won't. You knew I was going to come, right? I, no, but it's true. If you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. If you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. He says, bring it. So they brought it. And then we get this description of what they bring. And the number of the burnt offerings which the congregation brought was three score and ten bullocks and a hundred rams and two hundred lambs all of these were for the burnt offering of the Lord. And the consecrated things were 600 oxen and 3,000 sheep. Now, you ladies have went to the store and bought a chicken, a whole chicken, a whole turkey, and things of that nature, and you bring it home and you cut it all to pieces there in the sink. Some of you may have killed a wild animal and had to skin that animal. I've had the pleasure, <laughs> the privilege of skinning a deer, head to toe, chopping off his head, cutting off his legs, pulling out his guts. It's a bloody mess. Six hundred Oxen. An ox is a big animal. 3,000 sheep. So much, look at verse 34. But the priests were too few. There were not enough priests to cut up, to flay all of these animals. That's revival. When a man or a woman begins to give, and I'm not just talking about money, when a man or a woman, a young person, a child, begins to give, one of the greatest characteristics of God that can be manifested in one's life, for God is a giver. For God so loved the world, He gave. And once again, I'm not just harping on money. We're to give of our time, of our talent, of our resources. We're to give. We're to be givers. When you see a flood of giving, you're witnessing revival. Zacchaeus, somewhere from the tree to the ground, he hits the ground and he says, Lord, whatever I've taken, I'll give it back. Jesus hadn't told him to do anything. He's ready to give it back. So they had to call the Levites to help them until the work was ended, until the work of the priests had sacrificed themselves. For the Levites were more upright in heart to sanctify themselves than the priests. Verse 35. And also the burnt offerings were in abundance with the fat of the peace offerings and the drink offerings for every burnt offering. So the service of the house of the Lord was set in order. We have the sin offering for cleansing. We have the burnt offering for consecration. And we have here in verse 35 the peace offering and the drink offering which was communion. It was a time of fellowshipping with the Lord. If you want revival, you've got to learn to abide in Christ. You've got to learn to walk in the Spirit. You've got to learn to live a life of fellowship, practicing the presence of God at all times. Notice the fat. The fat was God's. That was considered the best part. You know what fat is? Stored energy. Some of y'all didn't get that. I'm talking spiritually. I'm talking spiritually. 
physically the same way, but fat is stored energy. It belonged to him. If I'm truly consecrated unto the Lord, if I'm truly communing with him, there will be no stored energy. That's his. Because I'm to be his. I'm to be all his. So the fat was his. Wish we had time. In Bible college, my Leviticus professor was a microbiologist. It was an amazing class, my favorite class ever. But the call and the fatty lobe was given. That was the adrenal gland of that animal. We know that adrenaline is that thing that gets us going, that, that drives us, that, that motivation. That was his. Interesting, the fat is the Lord's. That adrenal, that adrenaline, that, that gets me going, that lights my fire, that motivates me, must be, has to be, only can be Him. That's revival. When I'm communing with Him, and notice the last thing, verse 36, and Hezekiah rejoiced. He rejoiced, and all the people, why? God had prepared the people, for the thing was done suddenly. They rejoiced because they recognized God did it. God did it. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. I have nothing to boast of. Did I do my quiet time this week like I should? Yes, if I would say that. I can't take credit for that because it is God that works in me both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Did I prepare to serve? Did I give? Did I do all of these things? It is God that therefore I'm to rejoice. Far too many Christians are rejoicing because if it is to be, it's up to me. I'm praying. I'm studying. I'm going to church. I'm giving. That's a miserable way to live. I've done it. I showed up every time the door was open. Sunday morning. Sunday night. Wednesday night. Friday night. Every funeral. Every wedding. Folks, I didn't even know. I show up. Door open. Gotta be. Gotta be there. I'm doing it. Miserable, burnout, angry, agitated, aggravated. Hezekiah rejoiced, and all the people rejoiced. Because when we do these things, when we do all of these things, what it really is is it's, it's an open door, it's an invitation for God to do what He does best in us. And that's what revival is it's a reviving. It's a bringing to life, if you will. It's a keeping alive what God is doing in and through our lives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word tonight.